As part of their 2021 virtual winter programming, the Ohio State University Extension Beef Team was privileged to host University of Kentucky Livestock Marketing Specialist Kenny Burdine via Zoom on January 26th. During his presentation, Burdine detailed why, beyond simply trying to sell more pounds for more dollars, cattlemen needed to keep in mind the value of post-weaning programs, find ways to capture the benefits of uniformity in calf size, and do the little things that can each add more value to a calf. To summarize, in this portion of his presentation that evening, Burdine concludes by saying, you've got to be better than average year in and year out. So now we're going to shift gears and talk about some more management related things. And I'm just going to kind of leave you, you know, with, you know, with some thoughts that you might can implement to improve profitability, not just in 2021, but going forward. So three, three major kind of categories here. Talk about post weaning programs first and just keeping cash post weaning, you know, think about like preconditioning enterprises, short term backgrounding, call it what you want, but you know, do I want to sell cow cattle off the, do I want to sell calves off the cow or can I make some more money by keeping these calves a bit longer post weaning? Talk about some fairly simple things that I think it's easy to forget sometimes. And we'll talk about some things like that. So just basically don't stop doing, you know, good producers don't stop doing the little things. And then strive for uniformity. And that can mean a lot of things. Um, it can mean certainly how our cattle look, you know, color, breed, genetics, what have you. I'm gonna talk about it in terms of, um, of age and calving season, because I think that's a piece that can be pretty easily, I won't say easily, but can definitely be dealt with that I think has a big impact on our bottom lines as well. So this is the Kentucky market summary from, so this is that I, I brought this, I brought this up yesterday. So this is our market summary from last week. I'm gonna make a quick point though about just the value of preconditioning. So this was the report itself. This is, this is a complete copy and paste from Monday's report from our AMS market reporters. Feeder cattle were, most, were, most, were in mostly moderate to good demand with buyers showing the best demand for long wean 45 plus day preconditioned cattle. A statement like that is almost always on these market reports. This is the, this is the market reporters way of saying that Frankly, the cattle that were not green, that were not right off the cow, outsold the calves that were, period. A few quick examples. So our market reporters typically use the word value added when they are describing cattle that have at least, they, they're at least not fresh off the cow. They've been weaned and at least had one, have one sort of shot. So I've got kind of my light five weight category here. Okay, so here's my nondescript cattle, my non-value added cattle. They averaged about 143. Value added cattle about 152. So about a nine cent a pound or nine plus hundred weight difference. Here's the same thing for my heavy five. This is almost suspiciously high, but here's my, here's my nondescript cattle around 137. Value added cattle 154. Here's my light sixes. Value added 136, non-value added 132. I always tell the whole story. Here's the same thing from a heavy sixes, by the way, and I see just about a dollar difference per hundred weight. Now, for one, now one reason I want to point this out is because I, I don't want to doctor the numbers at all. Part of the reason why you see these premiums get smaller as calves get heavier, obviously, is because the, the, the lighter the cattle are, the more vulnerable they are, right? So that's a piece of it. And if you look at most of these, there's a pretty significant advantage to selling cattle that are not fresh off the cow in terms of price. Now, I wanna talk a minute now about the other piece of that. And a lot of folks will look at those premiums and say, well, you know, Kenny, if they're, if they're only paying, you know, another 10 cents a pound premium, and I'm weaning 500 pound steers, for example, that's 50 bucks a head. I don't think I can do for 50 bucks a head. And they're ignoring another key component, and that's the weight that those cattle gain during that preconditioning time period. So. When I talk to producers about preconditioning or you know we are keeping cattle post weaning, I like to kind of walk them through a series of things here. So it starts with calf price at weaning time. This is ultimately the cost, your first cost of a preconditioning program. What you don't sell that calf for at weaning time, that's cost number one. Then you've got to estimate what they're going to sell for in 45, 60, 90 days. And I'm going to show you a 60-day program here in just a second. 
There's ways to do that. Current market provides some direction. Futures provide some direction. But then you've also got to think, okay, if I'm going to be going from moving green calves to moving value-added wean-type calves, am I going to also get some price premium too? The answer is oftentimes yes. And the way I like to describe it is what you usually see is you don't see near as much price slide from selling your you know, 550 pound calf to selling a 700 pound steer um, when you actually have some premium thrown in there. So then I got to figure feed costs and I've got to think about other costs to do it. And I want to mention a few things about forwards that are kind of important out here I think as we kind of go forward. So simple scenario, and, and I'm doing this in January, so kind of bear with me. It's, it's a really weird time to be talking about preconditioning, but I don't want to ignore it either. But if a five weight steer is worth about $1.50, and, and that's not a bad estimate right now of our weaning calves right now, which no one probably is right now, but if I were it's worth $1.50, there's kind of a starting place. If I were to think about just a simple ration, two and a half percent of body weight, half of that from some sort of 50-50 corn gluten soy hull mix at 220 a ton, which is pretty expensive right now, obviously. And then the other half grass, hay at 75 bucks a ton. And assume that puts on about two and a quarter pounds a day. I figure mineral a quarter pound a day at 20 bucks a bag. Then I just try and estimate a sale price for a 685 that's value added in about 60 days. Return looks something like this. And, and I don't want you to focus on the numbers, just the concept so much, but this is what you want to do when you do this at weaning time. Think about what's my calf worth right now? What will it cost me to get them, you know, to, you know, whatever my target is. I'm using 60 days here, but you know, 90, 120 is also fine. You know, build in interest, build in an expectation of death loss, build in other costs and see what that looks like. Now, a few things I want to point out here that I think are important. Um, for one thing, I've got selling expenses very low. And the reason I do is because if I'm going to be selling these calves at weaning time, I'm going to pay commission at weaning time. So when I start thinking about the preconditioning program, the real additional selling cost is how much more commission do I pay selling, in this case, a 685 than I do a 550. And in truth, it's not very much. Similar on transportation. For a lot of us, it won't cost us any more to haul a 685-pound steer than a 550-pound steer. So a lot of those costs are already kind of sunk in a cow-calf enterprise, not to mention if these are own calves that I've produced, I'm probably going to have lower vet medicine expenses, and I'm probably going to have lower death loss. So I certainly want to keep that in mind. Um, all right, going forward. So when you think about doing this, now here's, here's the take on stuff. So I, I want to show you kind of a quick, a quick estimate that's, that's somewhat realistic based on now. But here's a quick estimate though. Look at this at weaning time, all right? Know it's constantly changing. And, and that's the most important thing is, you know, you want to do this literally at weaning time to make, to make a decision of what makes the most sense for you. Look at feed cost and look at value of gain. Understand most importantly that this is a viable sector of the beef system. There are people that do nothing but buy wean calves and put weight on them through grazing enterprises and through background and feed based type enterprises. Okay, that's what they do. So understand that that is a valuable part of the business. And it's always going to look better on own calves than purchased calves because they're lower risk calves. And like I said, some of those costs you're going to have with the cow calf sector anyway. So if I showed you that same budget on purchase calves and I've got higher death loss, more vet medicine expense, I've got full commission, full transportation, I can't make money in 60 days. Okay? It looks better if these are own calves from a cow calf operation than if I'm buying them myself. Also understand how grass impacts this. You know, I'm a big believer in grazing. You know, your cheapest pounds you can add are typically via grazing. In the spring, if you're a fall calving operation that weans calves in the spring, you know, most of us can't keep up with our grass in the spring. You're going to clip it, you know, in late May, early June anyway, right? In fact, if you can keep up with grass in the spring of the year, you're probably overstocked in the summer. So most of us simply have an excess of grass in the spring of the year. So if I'm a fall calving operation, I'm going to find a way to utilize that, whether that be keeping calves on the cow longer maybe pulling those calves off and grazing them for a period of time before I sell them. But there's some value right there of gain that I can snag pretty easily. 
a lot of folks like to think about fall grass as being free. In reality, that's the one I think is the most expensive because if I'm a if I'm a spring calving fall, I'm sorry, if I'm a spring calving cow calf operation, winning calves in the fall, and I've got excess grass in the fall to take some of those calves post weaning, understand the cost of that grass is actually the additional feeding days that I've got on those cows. So the rule of thumb that I like to use for valuing that fall grass is kind of a simple roughing economist rule here, but I get about two grazing days for a calf for one grazing day for a cow. So if it costs me, you know, simple math, a dollar fifty to feed a dollar fifty day to feed my cows through the winter, then every two days that I graze a calf, I lose one of those. So about 75 cents a day in that case is kind of a rule of thumb for what those grazing days are worth on those calves in the fall. So be aware, grass really isn't free. And in the case in fall, it's a matter of if I use that grass for my calves, that's grass I don't have for my cows, which means I feed more hay in the winter because of it. So that's the cost of using fall stockpile or fall grass. Don't stop doing the little things. Here's a simple one, you know, Sears, Sears versus Bulls. Um, you know, it was funny when the market was really high in 2014 and 15, had a lot of folks tell me, you know, Kenny, they're paying that much for a bull calf. I'm not going to bother cash right and selling steers. And then I hear the same thing when the calf market's low. Gosh, they're not paying for this. I'm not going to do it anymore. Um, one of the more common questions that I get from folks will be something related to steers versus bulls. And they'll call me and they'll be about half mad. And they'll say, Kenny, tell me why bulls are out selling steers at blank market. And what's inevitably happened is they've probably sold a group of steers and sometime, you know, while they're at the yard, they saw a similar group come through, a similar weight of bulls that sold for the same price or better. And that's going to happen from time to time. It absolutely is. I went back, though, when I pulled every monthly price, steers and bulls, state average, 550 pound weight category from January of 2010 to December of 2020. So I've got 11 years worth of data here. There was not a single month, month mind you, okay, when bulls actually outsold steers the same weight. On average during that time period, the difference was $11.14 a hundred weight, which means if I've got a bull calf and a steer calf that weighed the exact same, they both weighed 550 pounds, they ran through the yard side by side, the steer outsells the bull by $61.27, okay? So for False precision that this, it's a silly round number, think 60, 65 bucks, okay? Now, a legitimate question that you may have is, well, won't bulls outweigh steers? And the answer is, yeah, they probably will, okay? So I like to kind of quantify it this way. How many more pounds does that bull have to weigh to offset that price discount? Now, Understand additional pounds are not worth the sale price. If the average price for 550 pound steer is $1.50, another 100 pounds isn't worth $1.50 each, right? Because of price slide. As I add more pounds, that price comes down. So 80 cents to a dollar is a pretty good rule of thumb where value gain is in most markets when I account for price slide. So in a fairly high value gain market, that bull's got to outweigh that steer by 62 pounds, meaning if that bull weighs 550, I'm sorry, yeah, if, if that steer weighs 550, that bull's got to weigh 612 to offset that difference. In an 80 cent market, which is probably frankly more closer to normal, he's got to outweigh that steer by 77 pounds, which is a tall task. And unless you're in a market where you cannot use, if you're in a natural market where you're being paid for natural and cannot use implants, they provide an option as well because you can get kind of the, you can get the bull gain and still have the steer price. So look at your options. The market absolutely rewards us for steers versus bulls most of the time. Um, if there's one number on a cow-calf operation that tells me more than anything else it's a winning rate, it's calculated right. I think it is the most important measure for a cow-calf operator to track. Good operations should be in the 90%. So all I'm simply saying is what percent of my cows wean me a calf every year. So 90 to 95% is where good operations should strive to be. I promise you though, folks, there are people out there, maybe not in Ohio, but in Kentucky, there are some out there that are probably weaning calf crops somewhere in the, I don't know, low to mid seventies. And I can tell you the advice I would give someone who weans 93% calf crops 
is way different than someone who weans 73 percent gas price. Okay, so that's a number you need to know for sure year in, year out. Um, another way to say it would be, it's how I convert revenue per calf to revenue per cow. Um, if I look at what my average calf sells for and don't account for the fact that I had a certain percentage of my cows that did not wean me a calf, I'm way over inflating my revenue on a per cow basis. So I've got to make that conversion one way or another. Simple illustration here. If I assume a weaning weight of 550 pounds and I look at roughly $1.40 steer heifer average price, that's $770 per calf sold, okay? At a 90% weaning rate, which is very strong by the way, okay? That means that I, I'm gonna wean nine calves out of every 10 cows that I expose to a bull that revenue per calf of 770 is really a revenue per cow of 693 bucks. The same thing at 75%, at 770 per calf is 578 per cow. Again, big, big difference in what I can stand in terms of market price and profitability if I can think about this number and manage it very well. So the obvious question that comes in as a follow-up is, what about open cows? I don't advocate keeping them, very few people do. I have heard cases where someone has tried to make an argument that it makes sense to keep cows, that maybe they you know, didn't, didn't breed back the second calf. Okay, fine, you, you know, I could live with some of those sort of things. As a general rule, I, I don't like to keep up on cows, period. I think, especially when prices are where they are now, you know, I, I think you could lose potential in, in one year. I have producers that tell me that they have, a, they have two calving seasons. They have a spring and a fall calving season. And what they'll do is they'll roll uh, a cow from one season to the other. In other words, if she, if, she didn't, if she didn't get bred to calve in the spring, I'll bring her to calve in the fall. Okay, I can buy that. I'm, I'm losing half a year now, not a full year. But this is really a timing question, folks. It really is. And, you know, as we think about this in terms of calving or, you know, timing, I've got to preg check soon enough and know she's open soon enough to get her bread back and then cycle with the next season. So, you know, that makes sure that if you're using an argument that you really are in fact able to do just that. Cause I think a lot of folks probably don't preg check or let to actually shift from one season to another. Um, if you don't have a defined calving season, I would encourage you to start by simply managing calving interval, you know, write down the dates of when your cows calve, track that. For example, someone may say, well, yeah, she calved every year. You know, maybe she calved in January of 2017, April of 2018, August 2019, and you see where I'm going, right? Start managing calving interval. If you've got cows that are weaning or having a calf every 15 months, okay, she'll be open for every five years, right? So just understand that's the same thing as an 80% calving rate. So learn to manage calving interval. And folks, you gotta make that a culling criteria. You got to start unloading cows that aren't weaning a calf every 12 months. And if you start doing that, I think your calving season will tighten up as you do that. Um, late calving cows cost us a lot. And I want to make one quick point here that I think oftentimes gets overlooked. We oftentimes talk about late calving cows in the, in the, in the way that we think about, okay, every cycle that I miss is 21 days. Those calves are younger at weaning time, so I give up 40 pounds weaning, and that's absolutely true. Now, I'm probably am giving up 30 or 40 pounds of revenue for every cycle that I miss getting the cow bred because those, those, those younger, later born calves are smaller, period. That makes sense. The other piece of this, though, that I think gets lost sometimes is this one right here. This is probably the most important chart that I'm going to show you tonight. Some work that Greg Hallich and I did back in 2015. We did an analysis of um, precondition feeder cattle sales from Lexington from 2005 to 2012. We held everything constant statistically, including bed cattle market, corn price, type of the cattle, the type of cattle, when they were sold, weight. And all I'm showing you here is just two things, okay? The y-axis is the price improvement or price premium, a price difference. And the x-axis is how many calves sold in one group. And each one of these circles is five. Okay, so here's a group of five, group of 10, 15, 20, and so on. Now, somewhere up in here is a truckload lot. 
And we all know that if we could all sell truckload lots, we would. That's the most efficient way to sell cattle. Price tends to be highest. When I talk to a cow calf audience like I am tonight, though, I want to focus you on the other end of the chart. I want to focus you right down here because this is where the action is. Okay. So, for example, this is a single. This is a group of five. Okay. Will a group of five out sell a single? The answer is yes. In this study, by about eleven bucks a hundred weight. This isn't a pot load, folks. This is this is a group of this group of five. Okay. Will a group of ten out sell a five? Yeah, by about four bucks a hundred. Okay, so most of us are not big enough to be up here on this end of the chart. The story is I've got to stay out of this end of the chart. Now, how does this relate to calving season? Well, it's very simple. Those cows that are straggler cows, in addition to the fact that those calves are lighter at weaning time, there's also going to be fewer of them, which means they're going to be selling more along the left side of this chart in smaller groups. And when I account for both the loss in weaning weight and the fact that more of those smaller calves get sold as singles, twos, and threes, I think the cost can exceed $150 per calf sold for some of those cows that don't get bred on the first two or three cycles. So I'm a big believer in calving season. And frankly, although it's hard to do sometimes, culling is your best tool to get there. You've got to make this a culling criteria because it's folks, it's hard to back cows up. If she didn't breed the third or fourth cycle in 2020, she ain't gonna breed first cycle in 2021, right? So I gotta make some tough decisions and I've gotta make some culling based on that. Make that a criteria and part of the cow's job. Last thing I wanna talk about briefly is just share some thoughts with you on cow size and how this should impact my expectations of weaning weight for my cows. So it, it's pretty well established in animal science literature, and I'm an economist, not animal scientist, but it's pretty well established that weaning weight increases with cow size. Listen to a really good presentation by a woman in Lexington at an Alltech conference several years ago that did a meta analysis. She did an outstanding job. She did a meta analysis that looked at different studies and basically tracked mature cow size and weaning weight. And what she found was, yeah, bigger cows do wean bigger calves, but not proportionally so. And I think that was the key point that kind of got my mind thinking about this. I think we all kind of know it. We just don't oftentimes do a lot with it. There's no question, though, that maintenance cost per cow increase as cow size increases. So I combine this with this notion that a lot of producers don't know cost of production, and, and understandably so. I think this should be a goal for all of us, but it's difficult for a cow-calf operation. But you know, even if you do know cost of production, what you probably know is you know cost of production on average. So you may know what it costs you to maintain your average cow, but you don't know what it costs you to maintain this cow versus that cow versus another cow. And that really is what matters in terms of making culling decisions. Now, here's the reason that I'm saying this. There's a danger if I just simply use weaning weight as a criteria for cow culling. If I, simply start, if I simply start ranking my cows based on weaning weight and just start culling the cows that are weaning those smaller calves, on average, I'm going to be culling my smaller cows, okay? As I do that, my average cow size goes up and my costs go up. So the danger there is if I'm making culling decisions based on weaning weight and I'm ignoring the fact that some of those cows may be different sizes and may actually have different costs. So there's no easy way to do this, but I want to show you one simple approach and share some things with you that I think might make some sense. So if I provide you with a list of basic costs for a cow-calf operation, winter feed, pasture, vet medicine, breeding, mineral, trucking, market, transportation, breeding stock, all these things are important, okay? The vast majority of them are going to go up with cow size. Certainly winter feed is. She's going to consume more hay in the winter. We may not see it, but pasture side, or, I'm sorry, pasture costs go up. She consumes more pasture too. Bed medicine costs are kind of a grayer area, but if we think about dosages and treatments, yeah, that may go up as well. Breeding costs probably won't. She will consume more mineral. And at the margin, it may cost me more to, to truck a larger cow, for example. So a lot of these things matter. So we did just a quick, a quick spreadsheet analysis and kind of been sharing it with some folks, but we made these assumptions. We took our basic cow-calf budget and just tried to run it at different cow sizes, okay? So in other words, I took my basic budget and assumed that was like a 1,250 pound cow. 
Then I ran the same thing for cows of all different sizes. And the assumptions that we made were pretty simple. We assumed that feed, pasture, and mineral cost went up fully proportional, meaning that a 10% larger cow consumed 10% more feed, pasture, and mineral. We assumed that vet medicine, transportation, and other costs were half proportional, meaning a 10% larger cow had a 5% higher cost for vet medicine, transportation, and other costs. We assumed breeding costs weren't affected. So that's kind of the approach that we took. What our basic findings were, and this is kind of the simple take home, what we basically found was for every additional 100 pounds of mature cow size that I was maintaining, I needed about 50 more pounds of weaned calf to justify those additional costs. In other words, if you've got a 1,200 pound cow and a 1,400 pound cow side by side, the 1,400 pound cow is costing you enough more than the 1,200 pound cow that she should be weaning you a 100 pound larger calf. If not, the 1,200 pound cow is more profitable for you. Now, this is a good concept. It's hard in practice to know mature cow weights, although some folks may want to may want to weigh their cows. But one idea that I've had is could you use your cull cow weights as a way to calibrate cows into groups? And then just kind of in the back of your mind know, okay, this is a larger frame cow. I should have this expectation for her in terms of weaning weight. It's a moderate frame cow. Here's what I should be expecting in a small frame cow. Most important thing is understand conceptually that we can't just make our decisions based strictly on weaning weight. I've also got to think about how does that weaning weight compare to mature cow size and 50% of body weight gets us there at the margin. It's a pretty good rule of thumb. It's been around for a long time. A lot of folks did kind of push back on this and, and understand why they did. They raised the question about, well, you know, what about frame size? And rightfully so, they would say, you know, we really want to make sure that we're not getting small frame calves because we're all well aware there's big discounts for calves that go into that small frame category. Medium and large frame calves tend to be the bulk of what's reported, and that's kind of the baseline. And again, two studies here in Kentucky, we've seen 10 and $20 per 100 weight discounts on small frame calves. I do want to make this point though before I leave this topic, that for, for an animal to be small, to be graded small frame as a feeder animal, the grader has to think that when finished to half an inch of back fat, that steer is going to weigh less than 1,100 pounds and heifer less than a thousand. And I say that because our average slaughter weight right now is over 1400 pounds. So I just want you to understand that in most cases, we're a long way away from seeing a lot of our calves hit that small frame category. So if this is an issue for you that you'd like to target, a lot of you may well have more room than you think to bring down cow size some and still be well in that medium to large frame category. Um, I'm going to wrap things up here with a few final thoughts. Whenever I talk to cow-calf groups, I like to just share a few general comments. Um, so often economists do a talk like the one I've done tonight, and the feedback is, you know, it wasn't really that encouraging. And I do understand that. Some part of it's just simple, the way economists are trained, right? You know, we're, we're taught to analyze, we're taught to, you know, to look at things a certain way. And frankly, we're taught to kind of get in there and dig. That's just what we do. Um, so I do understand that. Um, I always tell folks, stick with what works and focus on what you can control. And you can control a lot of things. Some of the things you can't control are the market. And so oftentimes what I hear from folks is discussion of the market. But frankly, we're in an environment where it's difficult for us to do a whole lot to impact the sale value of our cattle. We've talked about preconditioning. We've talked about steers versus bulls. We've talked about lots as we've talked about some things that we can do to impact the market. But in a lot of, but in a lot of ways, more of that stuff is outside of our control than in our control. Look for ways to add value, be efficient, and always think long run. One of the things that I think has always been an Achilles heel in the cow-calf sector is we manage cow-calf herd, we manage cow-calf operations as though they're kind of a single year operation and they're not. Every cow that you own, you know, is a six, eight, 10, 12 year investment. And you've got to think that way about it. You know, why did bread heifer prices get so darn high in 2014? Well, it's because the calf market got so high in 2014. 
Did any of us really think it was going to stay that way for 8, 10, 12 years? No. But it would almost have to have done so to justify the $3,000 bread heifer prices a lot of us were seeing out there. Okay, so always think long term. Don't get wrapped up in current calf price. Think about you know, what's a realistic long run average calf price. Most of your decisions should be made with that number in the back of your mind, not current price. In reality, and this is just a bitter pill as well, but it's true, the average cow calf producer sees pretty limited return to land and management in the long run. I don't mean that he or she sees none, don't hear me saying that, but understand that we're in an environment where we're price takers, there's no barriers of entry, and as soon as we start making really good money, what's going to happen? We're going to grow the cow herd. We did it in 2014 and 15. We'll do it again here in a few years. Okay. Just understand that's the environment that we're in. We, we do spoil our own markets. And then we act surprised sometimes that's what happens. So a lot of folks look at that and they say, well, if the average cow calf producer sees limited returns to land and management in the long run, you know, why do I want to do this? I look at the other way and I say, well, if the average cow calf producer sees limited return to management in the long run, the message to me is don't be average. You know, profitable producers are the ones that do that do well in a normal market. They do really well in a strong market and they can survive a few years of a tough market. If that's a recipe for being profitable long run. So I've tried to give you a few ideas. There's lots of things you can do, but you always want to be looking for ways to become more efficient to wean better calves and to have a greater return to what you do. I do believe money can be made in the cow calf sector, but I absolutely believe the trick is you've got to be better than average year in and year out.